Welcome back to the Health Bridge. Dr. Pedram here today talking about chronotype. What is that? Well, we're about to find out because there's a lot of advice out there and we get it all the time. Most of it tends to be about what to do and how to do it. But my guest today believes that we need to focus on the when of success. Dr. Michael Bruce is a renowned clinical psychologist and he has published exciting new research on a book called, called The Power of When, showing that there's just a right time to do the things based on our biology and our hormones. Uh, he writes that working with your body's inner clock for maximum health, happiness and productivity is easy, exciting and fun. Dr. Bruce is with us to talk about getting in sync with your natural rhythm, figuring out your chronotype, and learn the best time to do 50 different activities. Welcome to the Health Bridge. It's good to have you here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. This is going to be fun. Yeah, so what is this thing called chronotype? I mean, I don't think, like, I have to set the table here because I don't think <laughs> half the people listening to this have heard of that. Well, they probably haven't, but actually, they probably have. So historically, when we think about chronotypes, have you ever heard of somebody being called an early bird or a night owl? 100%. So actually, those are chronotypes, mm -hmm. okay? And so, but we haven't thought of them that way before. So taking a step back, I'm an actively practicing sleep specialist. I work with people all the time. And one of the things I started to notice in my practice was people were not responding to my insomnia treatments. That's actually the area that I specialize in most within sleep is insomnia. And what we started to look at, we said, well, hold on a second. I'm trying these tried and true clinical practices based on evidence medicine to help you with your insomnia. And it didn't seem to be working very well. So I dove in a little bit deeper and I thought, oh, well, maybe they have what's called a phase delay. And a phase delay is where your entire circadian rhythm is shifted. Um, unbeknownst to you, maybe due to jet lag or shift work or something like that. So I started to walk down that path and then all of a sudden I realized, well, wait a second, actually what's really going on here is their body is set in a completely different rhythm. It wasn't because there was some outside influence like traveling across time zones or working on a late shift or something like that. It's like that's where their body is. So we started to do treatments for that. We tried to shift people back to what we called a normal rhythm. Well, you know, it's really kind of hard to mess with mother nature, totally. right? And so we were using light therapy, we we're using melatonin, we we're using caffeine, and you can use all of those things to shift your, your internal bio, body clock or what I call your bio time, but why? I started to wonder, why are we doing this? And so I said to some of my patients, can you fall asleep, stay asleep and sleep for a significant period of time and wake up refreshed at any point in time during a 24 hour cycle? And they said, well, actually, yeah, I can. It's just not when my boss wants me to do that, mm -hmm. right? Because some of my patients would stay up until two and sleep until 10 and they would get you know, called out at work by saying, oh my gosh, you know, you're late again. This is a problem. You must have a sleep disorder. Go see a sleep doctor. They didn't have a sleep disorder. They had a circadian rhythm situation that put them a little bit later. So they're not lazy, they're not bums, they're not to no. be judged. See, that, that's the culture we come from, right? Absolutely. Early to bed, early to rise, that's the only chronotype that, that works, right? Right, according to Ben Franklin, right, um, who turned out to be an early bird. And that's part of the reason why he was saying those types of things. What he didn't realize is only 15% of people out there have that earlier chronotype. Only about 15% have that later chronotype and there's a lot of people in between. Huh. So I started to say, well, what would happen if I knew somebody's chronotype? Could I actually match that up to a hormonal distribution and see what was going on there? Because all of a sudden it started to make mm -hmm. a lot of sense. Because when I would talk to my patients, they'd say, gosh, you know what? I'm really creative at this time of day. They were an artist or a writer or something like that. They'd say, I'm really creative at this one time of day, but my boss wants me to be creative at this time of day and it's mm. not working out too well. Mm. And so I said, well, maybe there's something to that. So we started to look in the literature. It turns out there's over 200 studies looking at different types of chronotypes and what they should do and when, more specifically, they should do it. And it was really actually kind of simple to start matching stuff up. I say simple, it took about a year right. <laughs> of really digging into the science and starting to figure things out. And the first thing we had to do was be able to find an identification method, an assessment, a quiz, whatever you wanna call it, that people could take to actively figure out what they were. So it turns out that there's four different chronotypes. There's the early bird, there's somebody who's in between, there's the night owl, and then there's the insomniac who's kind of got this crazy, weird chronotype that goes all over the place. Hmm. Well, I wasn't really too keen on the whole idea of being a bird. I'm a mammal and I wanted to, you know, have my mammal roots in something. And so I looked into the animal kingdom and it turns out that there are certain animals that run at different chronotypes. Huh. 
So instead of being an early bird, I call you a lion. Right? And it's interesting, lions, their first kill is at dawn. They hunt in what's called a pride early in the morning. They get a lot of their stuff done, and by mid to late afternoon, they're napping on the trees, they're hanging out. You know, if a gazelle goes by, they've already eaten, they're probably not that worried about it. Bears, on the other hand, are very solar creatures. So they rise with the sun, kind of graze all day, and then set. Um, they go to bed with the setting sun. So they kind of follow the solar calendar, which, by the way, 50% of people out there do. Mm -hmm. And then we had our night people, and I like, I like to think of them as wolves, um, because wolves are nocturnal creatures, and they're hunting, and they're cunning, and they're you know, kind of checking it all out um, late at night, and they've got night vision and all these kind of different things, and said, okay, well, that makes sense, but then what about my insomnia patients? Mm. So I started to look into the kind of mammal, animal kingdom, and dolphins turned out to really match them very well. Most people don't know, but dolphins sleep unihemispherically. So half of their brain sleeps while the other half is alert and looking for predators. Wow. And I thought that was a kind of an interesting representation of somebody with insomnia because they're never quite asleep, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, now I've got my animals. And so I had to create an assessment device. And there were some out there that looked at lions or that looked at wolves, but nothing that really ran through the gamut of telling us what everybody could possibly be. So I developed an assessment tool, um, and it's available online that people can go and take and figure out what their chronotype is. And then from there, I was able to say, okay, well, if you're a lion and you generally wake up at 6.30 in the morning, as an example, I can tell you the perfect time to have your first cup of coffee. People are like, wait, come wait. Come on. Right, exactly, like, come on, Michael, really? Yeah. I mean, come on, give me a break. So it's kind of interesting. If you're a lion, I know that when you wake up in the morning, your cortisol level is very, very high because that's what helps wake you up. Well, cortisol is about eight or nine times more powerful than caffeine. So by adding caffeine as the first thing that you drink in the morning, all you're doing is giving yourself the jitters and getting yourself addicted to caffeine. But we know that your cortisol level begins to drop approximately 90 minutes after you wake up. So if I add a stimulation like caffeine there, I can actually bring your energy level up, avoid a lot of the side effects, and allow you to use a small amount of caffeine in a very advantageous way. Hmm. So then I said, wow, if I can do that with coffee, what else can I do that with? Hmm. And so we started looking around, and it's pretty amazing. I've learned the best time to have sex, eat a cheeseburger, ask your boss for a raise, um, talk to your children. I mean, there's all kinds of really interesting things, and these chrono rhythms that are constantly going. Believe it or not, the body has almost 200 circadian rhythms. So your gut has a circadian rhythm, your brain has a circadian rhythm, all kinds of different things do. So early Chinese medicine talks about the kind of relative strength of an organ system based on a circadian clock. And right. it's like, you know, so this is the time to have breakfast, this is the time to poo. Right. So, so I talk about that too. Yeah. Well, <laughs> right, of course. So a lion poos different than a bear. Exactly. And so you have studies to back up all of these we based do. on the literature, and you just had to kind of aggregate and consolidate and figure it out. Exactly. And and it was kind of this fun exploratory situation. Like we had literally hundreds of studies and started to think about. I mean, I didn't even put everything in the book, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. There are probably another 40 or 50 different activities that aren't even in the book because the book was just getting so thick with huh. so many different activities. So this is kind of like the legacy. But when you look at Chinese medicine, there are absolutely some things that match up. And, um, and that made me feel really good because I really trust a lot of what I've learned, and I'm no expert in Chinese medicine by any stretch of the imagination, but what I've, the, some of the simple things that I've learned about it now really made me feel good about the fact that I was really looking at something that was before regular medicine, you know, mm -hmm. before sort of our whole Western idea of what medicine is, because you know, Chinese medicine has been around for thousands and thousands of years, and, and there's some really great stuff in there, and so I felt really good that it was kind of lining up nicely. It was matching up, yeah, well, and look, there's, Plenty of clinical trials that are coming out now, but if you have thousands, millions of people <laughs> right. over thousands of years, you get a lot of data, right? Yeah, and absolutely. If you're good, like the Chinese were at documenting things, you start, you start to see things. So, all right, so this to me is also a, a question of permission, mm -hmm. right? Because you are now allowed, if I'm listening to this, I'm like, oh wow, well, I'm, I'm a bear, I'm not a lion. Right. So, what does that mean? Do I need to renegotiate my hours with my boss? Does that mean that I Maybe. Need? Right. Yeah, and so very interesting. So I've had a couple of patients who, uh, you know, actually many patients who've adopted the chrono rhythms and started to look at them. And what's been really interesting is the number one thing we're finding is is that if they educate their bed partner or their their you know living partner as well as their work partners, all of a sudden things get a lot better for them. Mm. Specifically with my wolves, um, and so my wolves again, who are the late night people. 
um, they have the hardest time because they are so far from societal norms, right? These are people that want to stay up until 2 and sleep until 10. Mm -hmm. And so what's happened is they've historically been called lazy, good for nothing, you're never going to amount to anything. These are some of the most creative people in the world. Mm -hmm. um, even though they are a little bit introverted and they're not as socially easy to get along with, once you start them up, you almost can't stop them mm. if you get them in the right vein. And mm. so one of, the one of some of the most satisfying stuff I've been able to do is work with them. So for example, if I've got a wolf who's married to a lion, that can, be, that can be an issue, yeah. right? But if they know it and they can work within it and they can say, oh, you know what? You're going to be better watching the baby late at night because you're already up and I'm not going to be good at night and I'm going to go to bed early. You can actually cause some really good mm -hmm. balance there in a relationship. And the same holds true at work. Um, I've been starting to work with businesses now. And so businesses say, well, I've got creative needs for my employees. Well, you know, I, I've got to get them to create, like let's say at an advertising agency mm -hmm. where creativity is supposed to happen 24 hours a day. It doesn't really work that it way. It doesn't. You, they, know? They, you could fake creativity during those other hours. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And so I can actually show people when they have times of what I call groggy greatness. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out that brainstorming, and which is one of the topics that we cover in the book, is actually at certain times of the day, you're far more likely to brainstorm and brainstorm effectively than at other times of the mm -hmm. day. And so that can be good not just for creatives, but it can be good for regular old business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I look at this, and we, and so, you know, I, was, I had my little stint in sleep medicine. We had a director uh, of our sleep lab and all this. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing to me to see how sleep medicine was about. Sleep tests. Yes. Which is, you know, a plumbing thing, right? Like, hey, are you blocked here? Can exactly. you not breathe? Let's let's, you know, let's reverse engineer a vacuum cleaner and shove that's, air down your throat. Yep. And that's sleep <laughs> medicine. Where, you know, how many are there? There's like what, fifty at least types of insomnia? Oh wow. Um so if you wanted to try to figure out well, there's 88 known sleep disorders, huh. okay? And within that, there's about 12 different kinds of insomnia that have been documented where we've got criteria. I would argue there's probably twice that many. Hmm. I mean, you know, the known ones are things like I can't fall asleep and I can't stay asleep or I wake up too early. But you know, the insomnias that I deal with are insomnia secondary to depression, to anxiety, to pain. Hmm. Um, all of those different things, they're not very well known. And, and that's one of the biggest hmm. problems, quite frankly, when you look at medicine and sleep medicine in particular, um, it's a lot about apnea and narcolepsy um, and occasionally about restless legs and periodic limb movements. Nobody wants to touch insomnia, um, quite frankly, because all they're really doing usually is writing a prescription. So patience. Mm -hmm. This is a big deal because I know thousands of people out there in our audience alone <clears throat> that have sleep issues. They try to meditate, they try to restrict their caffeine, mm -hmm. they try all these things uh, and you know the thing that had worked maybe was Lunesta until it stopped or right. you know, so, so there was all these kind of like drug sure. interventions that kind of came and went mm -hmm. and people are you know so whether it's kava or melatonin and all this so people are just throwing darts. Absolutely. So now with a, a superstructure like a chronotype how are you seeing the results change? Well, it's fascinating. And so one of the nicest things is, is that once I educate my patients, for example, that you're a wolf, then they realize, oh, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit different than society. Maybe I don't need to take Ambien, Lunesta, what have you, in order to force my body to sleep. But if I can respect my body's natural boundaries and go to sleep when I need to, and explain that to my boss and, and to my partner, then it works out much better. Mm. What, I, what I can tell you is I've seen the happiness factor go up, mm. uh, which is kind of nice, and the guilt factor go down. Mm. It's been amazing. I have so many patients who come to me and they say, Michael, I failed at sleep. Right? I mean, isn't that an interesting thing to hear somebody say? I'm supposed to just fall asleep and I can't even do that. Right. And that's yeah. exactly what they mm. think. It's amazing. Mm. They get in there and they're like, okay, sleep. And you know, of course, that doesn't work because sure. you've got all this autonomic arousal, sympathetic activity, which makes it so that it's almost impossible to mm -hmm. sleep because people just get pissed that they're lying in bed, it's dark, and nothing's happening. Yeah. So I think expectations are starting to change, which mm. is really important. I mm. think education is leading the way for some of that, and I'm not convinced that people need to take something to fall asleep. Mm. You know, mm. I tell people all the time, most people's sleeper is not broken. You uh -huh. know, that switch in your head. Um, and by the way, it's not just, it's not a switch either. That, uh, that I guess probably shouldn't even use that as an analogy, because most people think, oh, I go into that, dark room in the back of the house and I'm supposed to be there for somewhere between six and eight hours and hopefully I come out refreshed. 
Um, you know, sleep doesn't work. It's not an on-off switch. It's more like slowly pulling your foot off the gas and slowly putting your foot on the brake. Mm. There's a process that mm. we have to know and respect. One of the things that I talk about in the book is something I call the power down hour. So I have people setting their alarm clocks not to wake them up, but to tell them when to go to bed. Mm because it forces them to walk into their bedroom and then they get all those uh, environmental cues like, oh, why am I in the bedroom? Oh, it's my time to go to sleep. And then I have them section out that one hour before bed. So 20 minutes to do things you just have to do. Um, unfortunately for some people that's email. I'd rather they didn't do that, but in our house it's getting the kids' backpacks together, finding shoes, getting my briefcase together, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. 20 minutes for some level of hygiene, wash your face, change into bed clothes, maybe even take an evening shower. Um, and then 20 minutes for some form of meditation and relaxation. And everything from prayer, reading scripture, um, med full-on meditation, I've even got people doing bed yoga. Um, you know, things, things like that, and it actually works out really, really well. Mm. Um, kind of an interesting thing, people always ask me about sex for sleep, right? So if I have sex at night, will it help me sleep? Turns out it only works for men. Um, <laughs> there's huh. actually data to show that women actually post-orgasm have a lot of oxytocin in their system and it's very alerting for them, whereas men, um, actually while they do have oxytocin, a lot of times they're so sleep deprived anyway, they just Fall asleep. Out. Interesting. So for women, it's not as healthy if you want good sleep to have it then. So morning sex? So this is actually one of the most popular topics in the book. So mm -hmm. I did an entire section on your chronotype and sex. Huh. And if you think about it, think about the hormone distribution in the evening. Low testosterone, low estrogen, low progesterone, low cortisol, high melatonin. What could be worse? Totally. time to have sex, right? Huh. If you look at the data, 72% of people say that the reason that they have sex at night is convenience. Sure. The, their bed partner is there, it's the end of the day, the work schedules line up, okay, mm -hmm. let's go ahead and have sex. I, would show, I can show you data to suggest that desire and actually having more healthful sex, right? So loving relationship, levels of oxytocin increase, levels of stress decrease with morning sex. And mm -hmm. so, but what if you're on the wrong chronotype? Right? What if your partner's a lion and you're a wolf? How do you coordinate that? I actually created a matrices um, to look at that to get people to figure that out. So you have a best negotiated time. For exactly. Sex. That's exactly. great. That's great. You know, the, the challenge I see with that um, is it's just so damn busy in the mornings. I mean, so you've packed the backpacks, you got the books, mm -hmm. you got the the, sh the kids' shoes and all that. Right. And then you know, either you're waking up earlier to make love and have that kind of that time. Right. Or you know, the kids are knocking and the, you know, the phones are ringing and the, the world's already booted up, right? <laughs> yeah, now that, now that is true, that can happen. Saturday morning sex and is actually turns out to be one of the best prime times for sex. So, you know, lock your door, um, you know, make sure there aren't any animals in your bed because mm -hmm. that can be an issue as well. Lots mm -hmm. of people sleep with animals in their bed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Saturday morning sex is one of the things that I'm constantly recommending to people, but it doesn't always have to be that early in the morning for it to be effective. Um, you know, in the 8, 30, 9 o'clock range could be good. So, you know, what if you went into work a little late on Wednesdays and so did your partner and that was your time after the kids have gone off to school to come back hmm. and, and enjoy that loving relationship a little bit more, if that's certainly an option. Hmm. Hmm. If you could shut it out. Exactly. Yeah, if you could shut out your day. So the power of when, there's so many things that can get layered <laughs> in this, right? Because, I mean, from getting healing, like going to a massage or going mm -hmm. to a therapist or all these different things. I mean, you must oh, yeah. have different chronotypes that like are times in the chronotypes to allow for you to kind of, it's almost like um, astrology in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Well, and, and you know what I, the kind of thing that I'm looking at it from the standpoint is, is that there is a perfect time of day to do just about anything. And I don't think that people have to, once you know your chronotype, change everything mm -hmm. about your day, because let's be honest, that would be impossible mm -hmm. to try to do something like that. But what I ask people to do is figure out your chronotype and then just pick two or three activities and change them and see mm -hmm. if your performance is better. See if you're getting something different out of that activity than mm -hmm. you normally would have. Um, and if it works for you, then you're, you're on the right start. And then you can mm -hmm. start to add more and more activities mm -hmm. as time goes on. How many years ago did you kind of come to this this realization? 
Well, I've been in clinical practice for 16 years, um, and I've been an insomnia specialist that whole time. I, I treat apnea, narcolepsy, I do all the traditional sleep doctor stuff. Mm -hmm. um, un under with the with, while working with an MD, I'm a PhD, not an MD, so we work together as a team. Um, but it really kind of started to dawn on me about three, four years ago because I had gone into solo practice. I was only treating insomnia patients, and it wasn't, it just wasn't working the way I thought it should work. Mm -hmm. And so through about three or four years of discovery, working with patients and reading the literature, it sort of developed. It's, it, it's one of those things that I think we all deal with, the square peg round hole thing. Right. It's, you know, I'm trying to fit you, Mr. Individual so-and-so, into this stupid model. Right that we arbitrarily all subscribe to. Yeah. And that's a problem with our education system, it's a problem with our food, it's a problem with everything, right? Everything. So now you're seeing this with patients going, why? Why, why do I have to put you here? Right, and, and what's great about this is, is that really most people will fall into one of these four categories. It's nice that I don't have 12 categories, because that mm -hmm. would just get confusing. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, when we just base it on your levels of sleep, it's, it actually works out really nicely. Mm -hmm. it work, it's super smooth, and people really understand it, because they say, oh yeah, I, you know, on, on my vacation, I would much rather stay up late and sleep in, and, and so it turns out that they're a wolf, and then they can kind of start to figure those things out. Interesting, yeah, so listening to you, and I'll take the quiz later is I think I'm a bear but I'll figure it out. 50% of people are yeah, bears. Yeah so if I'm a gambling man I'm a bear. Uh, <laughs> but if I'm listening to you uh, as a dolphin I'm like what the hell what about me? So what, about, what about the dolphins? Absolutely and so we actually spend a lot of time on the dolphins because those are my patients. Totally those are the ones that wash up on the beach at your clinic. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I haven't thought about that way yeah. that's a great way to put it. Yeah. yeah they do they kind of wash up on the beach at my clinic and we got to get them in the water and reviving them yeah. pretty quick. So one of the first things I do with my dolphins is we look for a sleep schedule that will actually work within their confines. And so we try different sleep schedules. So with dolphins, I actually start out and I try lion schedules and then I'll try bear schedules, which usually don't work because we already know that the bear schedule isn't working because that's how most people are. And then we try wolf schedules. It turns out that about 60% of my dolphins will actually work very well on a wolf schedule, huh. which is interesting. Um, then still some differences. And so once I can get them sleeping consistently, then things start to fall into place. Um, but it's tough. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times I'm using cognitive behavioral therapy, which actually now there's data to suggest that it's more effective than Ambien, Lunesta, almost all pharmaceutical intervention. Mm -hmm. And I've been well trained in that, so that's what I like to do. Great, and so, okay, so you're doing behavioral therapy and all this. I'm assuming you're doing basic like sleep hygiene, it's a terrible word, hygiene. But basic sleep hygiene is like, okay, well don't have caffeine, because the half-life here and there, but if you're a wolf, Mm -hmm. then your caffeine ingestion and schedule would, would Change. all shift. Absolutely. Right. And so all of those, those you know, general rules are out the window. I want to create individualized rules. I hate the word sleep hygiene, by the way. Yeah, it's terrible. It's because it makes you think that you've got dirty sleep otherwise, totally. you know, and that's just not the case. It's totally. just that people's, you know, oh, and by the way, your chronorhythm changes over time. Huh. Right, and so I have a 14-year-old and a 12-year-old. So I don't know if you have kids or you've got friends with kids, but if you talk to a 14-year-old, they're wolves all day long. You period. Know, right. Period. End of story. Doesn't matter. They want to stay up late and sleep late. Right, and so you start to look at that change over time, and it gets really interesting really quickly. So what we try to do is we look at people's chronorhythms in time, right, where they are in their life, like a, like in their chronology. But it also turns out that there are seasonal differences as well. Hmm. And why would that be? Sunlight. So sunlight is the main thing that actually changes all of this for people. And so it's all based on your melatonin cycle. And melatonin is based on core body temperature, and both of those are affected by sunlight. So when you get sunlight, it either turns the melatonin faucet on or off. Interesting. So people in Iceland might have a very different experience. Of Absolutely they will. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And, and it's... I wish there was an easy answer, but that's not how reality works, right? No, like we are not. all different. We all have individualized needs and sure. individualized exposure to the sun. I mean, if, even if you live in the UK, you're getting Absolutely. less light, right? Yeah. Oh, and here's what's really interesting is as you age, you know, you start to see corneal yellowing, hmm. um, and then that changes the level of light exposure that hits your melanopsin cells, which sends signals to your pineal gland to produce melatonin. I had a patient who I thought was a wolf 
and they ended up having um, corneal implants and they were a bear because the light was finally getting into their eyeballs the right way. Wow. So the It was the, so cool. They grew curtains. Right. Wow. Interesting. 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 And so do you still use kind of like light books and like full spectrum light, all that kind of interventions for people to adjust? I do. Um, and especially if somebody's in a weird situation where they say, look, I'm a wolf, but I, I don't have any choice. I have to be a bear. Mm -hmm. Then I can create schedules for them where we use melatonin, light, and caffeine strategically um, and push them you know, one or two mm -hmm. hours in either direction. It's gonna be almost impossible to change somebody who's a wolf into a lion. Mm -hmm. People have lion envy mm -hmm. a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. They're like, gosh, I'd love to be a lion because I get up at 5.30 and I get all this stuff done. You know, being a lion isn't all it's cracked up to be. Um, you miss the parties. Yes, you do. Socially is where they, you hit the nail on the head, socially mm -hmm. is where they have the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. So they're great and productive and they're up before dawn and they're getting stuff done, but they're going to bed at 8.30, 9 o'clock. Totally. And nobody wants to hang out with them. Totally. You know, whereas, it, it creates problems with their spouse sometimes if oh, their spouse isn't a lion. Yeah, well, and it creates problems with their kids, hmm. right? So if you've got teenage kids and you're a lion and they're wolves, you go to bed, you know, who knows what's going on in the house right. after that. Or you get draconian and then they hate you. <laughs> and you're like, you will be in bed at such yeah. and such a time. My house, my rules, exactly. damn it. Yeah, yeah that and, never works. Huh, interesting. And, and so, okay, you, I, I'm gonna take the quiz. I think everyone listening should take the quiz just to know who they are yeah. and figure out what, Thanks. you know, how they interact with, with this universe. And then based on that, you start mapping different types of lifestyle I don't want to use the word intervention, but lifestyle practices for sure to see how you can kind of nuance your way towards kind of using your strength to your strength, right? Absolutely. Um, a prime example, if I can, um, is people oftentimes ask me, when's the best time to ask my boss for a raise? There's a time for that? There is a time for that, right? Everybody's perking up their yeah, ears now totally. listening, right? So there's been a couple of different studies to look at a few different characteristics and what you would want to have in yourself in order to go and ask for a raise. Hmm. So let me give you the example. So first of all, we know that people become more positive over the course of the week. So never ask for a raise on a Monday because hmm. there's too much going on in the week. Um, it turns out that Friday is the most positive day because you're one step from the weekend. A lot of the stuff that you've had to get done is already done. So you know your boss is probably gonna be in a more positive mood on Friday. Mm -hmm. We also know that as the day gets longer, the later in the day, we also know that you get even more positive because it's almost quitting time and it's mm -hmm. time for the weekend and you've really wrapped up all the work and you're just kind of tying up a few loose ends. So Fridays in the later afternoon from two o'clock on seems to be a great window for people. But what about you? Hmm. Right? So when am I gonna be most articulate? When am I gonna be able to present my case the best and when am I gonna do that? Well, it's gonna be during the times that you're most alert, right? And so we actually now know, based on cortisol ebbs and flows, that in the late afternoon, depending upon your chronotype, it's either gonna be two o'clock, three o'clock, or six o'clock. Hmm. So for wolves, it's six o'clock, but it's kinda of hard to get your boss at six o'clock on a Friday night. Yeah, they're gone. Right, they're, they're out of there. So for wolves, we have to make some, some kind of adjustments. So on the days that you think you're gonna ask for that raise, we might actually have tried to push your chronotype a little bit earlier so that your level of being articulate is a little bit earlier in the day. Mm. Or we could use a little caffeine to our advantage to help you be able to, again, focus and be more clear. Make sense? Targeted, targeted, nuanced use of caffeine, light, and all these other things. Exactly. That's you know that that's kind of bang, banging the the edges in so that you can stay within bumpers. But actually, living within this this framework mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. It really does, <laughs> uh, man. So. If you're looking at the levels of cortisol being different based on your, your um, chronotype, yes. then what you can also look at is your metabolism and when you should be eating? That's correct, absolutely. And so when you start to look at all the things that affect the metabolic rate, right? And so when you look at leptin, you looked at ghrelin, you look at cortisol, you look at all the things that affect metabolism, those are the hormones that affect you. Um, and you know what kind of scale those go on, you kind of know when it's good time to eat and when it's not a good time to mm. eat. And blood sugar turns out to be one of the most predictable um, circadian rhythms out there, mm. right? And so if you can keep your blood sugar at a nice kind of even keel, guess what? You have energy all day. And, it's, and it still goes back to the idea of grazing more so than having these large, large meals. Mm -hmm. But if you have to eat bigger meals, my recommendation is going to be more a protein-based meal in the early morning than kind of a medium meal in the afternoon, including carbohydrates. And then believe it or not, 
not having carbs towards the end of the day, there's a lot of data to show that carbohydrates increase serotonin, which helps relax you and helps you go to sleep. Yeah, yeah, carbs at night really helps. The nightcap really helps. Yeah, carbs have gotten a really bad rap. They right. have. I'm a carb fan, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but the I, right kind of carbs, right? That's it. You know, I mean, I'm not talking about eating Twinkies and King Dons, you know, late at night, mm -hmm. you know, but what I'm talking about are good, solid, complex carbohydrates that can actually be quite helpful for you in the right. evening. And people don't know what that is because the, the, the media now makes everything such bad. a mess. Everything's yeah. bad. Everything's, right. everything's bad for you. Right. You should be afraid of everything. And so, you know, drink my shake. Right. right. And, and right. That, that's where the exactly. industry is gone. And it's such a mess. It's, it's, it's ugly, actually, because it's productized this thing called food right. and then you have no choice but to just eat what you know this this doctor you know whether it's your chiropractor or your natural mm -hmm. path everyone's trying to sell something and you know at the end of the day vegetables are still pretty cool yeah and uh, they work and mm -hmm. um, they're pretty tasty and you know you can actually get all the nutritional value that you need you know one of my favorite speaking of uh, vegetables and looking at just foods in general people always ask me all the time are there certain foods for sleep that can be more helpful Mm -hmm. Right, and so it turns out that magnesium is a really, really helpful for sleep. It actually helps calm the nerves down and helps get people more relaxed. And it's great for my dolphins who have problems. And so mm -hmm. I actually created a recipe called banana tea. Mm -hmm. So most people don't know, but bananas have a lot of magnesium in them. But it turns out that the peel has three times the amount of magnesium in the peel. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I'm gonna make people eat the peel of the mm -hmm. banana. I'm not. So here's what you do. Take an organic banana, mm -hmm. hopefully no pesticides. You wash it all off, cut off the tips, cut it in half. Keep the fruit in and the peel on. Boil it for about four minutes and then steep the water and drink the water. It's got two to three times the amount of magnesium that just eating the fruit would have. It's delicious and you're right off the bed. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. You know, it's funny is I've, I've been a fan of uh, Epsom salt baths and, yep. you know, back in the day before kids when I had time to like right. relax in a bathtub. Right. Whole different ballgame. Yeah. It, it, it really made a difference. And so for patients, it's really made a difference. But if you're trying to take, if you're a wolf and you're trying to take an Epsom salt bath at 7 p.m. Bad idea. Because, everyone, because everyone's saying, you know, you need to go to bed and it doesn't work. Now mm -hmm. you have an understanding of why. Exactly. And, yeah. and that's exactly how I want people to use this mm -hmm. knowledge is like, well, wait a second. I'm a wolf, and so a lot of things are actually later for me. I have wolves eating later in the day, whereas a lot of people out there are like, no, you need to eat you know, and finish your last you know, bite by 7.30. No, my wolves are starting dinner at 8 o'clock at night mm. because that's when their metabolism is ready mm. for it because I'm having them go to bed at 11.30, 12 o'clock. So they could also stay up and watch House of Cards. Absolutely. Interesting. Because some people need to decelerate. Some people do need to go. I, I had a guy in my dorms like that. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, he just couldn't sleep. And the rest of us were like, dude, shut up. Right. <laughs> he just well, didn't fit in, right? Yeah, ab absolutely. And, it's, you know, it's funny that you mentioned something like House of Cards, which I'm a big fan of, by the way. So, um, my wife and I, we, watch, we love to watch television as we're falling asleep. So now you're saying, well, wait a second. Isn't that like a major no-no? You're not supposed to watch. So I'm the sleep doctor. People see me all the time. Yes, I fall asleep with the television on. I'll explain to you why. A couple of different things. Number one is there's a big difference between a television that's about 15 feet across my room than an iPad that is about 18 inches from my face from a blue light exposure standpoint. Mm. So a lot of people have heard, oh, watch out for blue light. It's really a proximity issue more so than anything else mm. in terms of telling your brain that it's morning. Um, second of all, most of the time when you're watching TV to fall asleep, you're not really watching, you're listening, mm. right? So people have their eyes closed and they're kind of listening to the television. 95% of TVs have TV timers in the software nowadays. Mm -hmm. So just set the timer till it goes off after 45 minutes and you'll be fine. I'm the only sleep doctor I think in the universe that totally. says it's okay to fall asleep with the TV on. But especially for my dolphins, what I find is, is that they can't turn off their brain. Mm. And that's one of the easier ways for them to turn off their brain. And if I rip that out from under them, they'll never sleep. Got it. So you're giving them permission to be a dolphin and you're mm -hmm. also giving them permission to not be too too kind of militant about things. Because, you know, frankly, if you're old enough to be listening to this and you're a dolphin, you've pretty much suffered from not being, you know, yeah. you're not being normal. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. It's, it's hard. You need permission to relax around this now. And I think that's where some of that guilt comes in that we mm. were talking about earlier is people are like, but, you know, everybody says I'm supposed to get eight hours and I'm supposed to get more of my sleep time before midnight than after midnight and mm -hmm. all these these tales and myths that have been out there that I'm here to say, no, 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 We're there are different types of sleep. And more importantly, there are different types of sleepers. Mm. And if we know what our chronotypes are and we follow those, 
you know, Mother Nature created those for a reason. Mm. And I can't say I know exactly what that reason is, um, but I do have some ideas. You know, if you went back to caveman days, right? Um, and you had wolves, what would wolves do? Wolves would actually protect the group because they would be the ones who were up while, the other, while many people were asleep. Someone had to. Right. And then what would the lions do? They would be up early and hunt and they would be able to capture food, you know, meat or go gather or things like that. And what do bears do? Bears are the producers during the day. Dolphins, I'm not so sure what, mm, <laughs> what their mm. need was. I think dolphins actually came around much later. I think dolphins came around with the advent of the incandescent light bulb, stress, work, mm. and things like that. Uh, question. I, I've had over the years, I'm, I'm a big nature enthusiast. I go backpacking. Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time in the backcountry. Sure. And over, over the years, I've recommended to patients of mine, say, that, look, you know what? Just go get a cabin up in the sequoias or something like that. Sure. Just go spend a week or two decelerating and going up and down with the sun, right? Or go camping better, mm -hmm. better than anything. And I've seen that, that, you know, kind of syncing up with nature's rhythms works for most. However, if you're a wolf, you're up looking at the stars for a couple more hours, right. and, but you know it just it's you you you're, you come into like a more of a mean, if you will. Mm -hmm. right. I personally, my own personal beliefs are: I think the easiest way to center yourself is with nature, right? And so I have a so my son and I do this. Um, so I live in California, and I'm fortunate enough to live near the beach. And my son and I like to surf. Okay, and I will tell you: if you want to get close to your child, be in the water on a surfboard no electronics, have a conversation. Mm. You want to get centered like that, mm. that's how it happens for me. And so I can really identify when you talk about being in nature. I mean, yeah, I have to get out and I have to get in my car and drive home, but it's really interesting when you look at what can nature do. And if we just follow nature, uh, uh, you know, in high tide, low tide, you know, lions, wolves, right? I mean, mm. it's all there, mm. you know, the lunar cycle. There's actually now data to show that lunar cycles affect sleep. Mm. Um, ask any ER doc and they will tell you, sure. night of a full moon, it's going to be a mess um, mm. because there's, there's some significant issues uh, and there's actually documented data showing sleep changes with the lunar cycle. So mm. I'm a big fan of getting back to nature and I think this is one of my ways of doing that mm -hmm. is, is saying, look, it's still there. Like, just awaken that part of you. I guess that's a bad pun. Um, you know, awaken that part of you and realize that this is something that's already in you and you don't have to make excuses um, for being tired in the mornings because you know what? If you're a wolf, you're supposed to be tired in the mornings. Mm -hmm. and you don't have to make excuses for going to bed early because if you're a lion, that's kind of what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. And that's yeah. who you are. Well, and, and that's really kind of this problem with the one-size-fits-all medical model. Uh, you know, in the old days, we didn't know there was a microbiome. So it was just like, right. let's drop a bomb. And so, like, as we're learning, we're learning what we should have probably been doing all along, but it's it, like uh, medical science is developing too, right? It, right. It's, we, I think we've kind of gotten over this like the, the hubris era right. of like we understand <laughs> We everything. know it all, we know right? It all. We're so smart. Out, shut up and sit down in your waiting room and da-da-da. And, right. and so, so we, we get it. Like so there's, there's things, we figured them out, uh, and we figured out that we hardly know anything and that there's so much more to know. Which is great. Now we're learning, right? So Absolutely. chronotypes. That's, I mean, it's new to me. I think it's I, when I saw it, I was just like, man, that's that's interesting. I like this. Yeah, it makes sense, and I think people can relate to it, um, and and it can be so helpful. Um, you know, one of my favorite chapters is when to talk to your children, hmm. right? And so that's an issue. You know, is understanding like where your child is in their chronotype life, right? And so let's say that you've got a toddler esque middle school, like kind of in that age range of about four to about seven, right? So when is their attention span gonna be on point? You wanna hit them with, if you've got a big idea like when to go to bed or to eat your vegetables or you know a specific spiritual aspect that you wanna teach them, you kinda of don't wanna hit them when they're used to watching cartoons, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You wanna hit them at a time where their mind's gonna be open. Well, that's what we talk about in the book. Then we go forward with teenagers, right? How, is, how easy is it to talk to teenagers? It's almost impossible. Mm. Why? Because you're not on their schedule. Mm. If you get on their schedule, you'd be surprised how, how much you'll get. Uh, and that's uh, also a testament to our egocentric form of communication. Of course. Right, is, you know, my, my house, my rules, my, oh, yeah. my, my time, you're, you're gonna listen now. Right. And so it, it really makes us kind of look at how we communicate. Yeah, and, and, and what's so great about this whole program is just try it. It, it can't hurt, right. right? I mean, all I'm telling you to do, I'm not telling you to not talk to your children. Right. I'm saying just change the time, you know, right. the power of when. When you speak to them, you might find is 
I mean, what happens if you actually open up that line of communication and you learn a lot about your kids and, and it turns out to be a really good thing, right? Totally. Well, That's and, and one of the things that people say is like, my boss just won't have it. It's like, well, what your boss is paying for isn't necessarily your time. They're paying mm -hmm. for your productivity Absolutely. and the output. So, and I, in our, with our corporate wellness clients, I say, look, just negotiate and say, look, we're going to take a 30-day, 60-day window. Mm -hmm. We're going to try it my way. And here's our, our markers. Here's like our, my performance indicators. Let's see if they've gone up or down. Exactly. If you do this, if you can talk your boss into something like this, you'll be shocked. Amazing. So the book is called The Power of When. Oh, Flash it this way for our video <laughs> audience. Uh, it's great, Dr. Michael Bruce, uh, pronounced like Zeus, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's about discovering your chronotype, uh, have the best time to eat lunch, ask for a raise, have sex, write a novel, take your meds, and more. I think I think this is great. I think this is very novel, and um, it's uh, and, and I know you've been on Dr. Oz like a million times, and the <laughs> forward was written by him. So, uh, good stuff. Um, Thank I wish you. you the best with this, and I'm gonna take my quiz and I'll, I'll share it. I'll share it as well, so we can all kind of figure out um, how our chronotypes work for us. Awesome. I'm very excited. Thank you. Yeah, great to have you. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.